Hello everybody, my name is Chet Spinney and I'm a key grip. I've been a grip for 35 years and I've been a key grip for 18 years. I guess we're here today to show you how to, do to uh, level dolly track. The reason you want the camera to be level so that your camera, your angle is not askew when you're going back and forth or panning across a horizon or even panning across a table from one actor to another. So, I guess we can get going on that. Yeah? This is Dolly Track. Right now it's in the scissored position. Pull it open like this. Place it down like this and bring it up. Keeping your fingers away from here, it will cut your fingers off. It's a scissor, it's a crush point. You lay it down in a predetermined direction that your director of photography or your director has told you. Either they want the camera running this way, they want it running this way, straight in. You set it how they want. You put your feet down like this and you feel it. There's a couple of high spots, a couple of low spots. Take your level. Put it down like this. Okay, this floor is really good. It's level everywhere. But there are some high spots because A, either there's a rock underneath or there is a bend in the track that can happen. So we go back and forth like this. Again, it's very level. So what I'm going to do is just take my foot with some wedges. These are wooden wedges. You can see what they're a wedge. There's a little spot right here, a little bit of flex. So I'm just going to stick the wedge in here takes the flex out. You can hear when it's not making any noise anymore. I want to put another piece right there. All right, I've got a level piece of track for this dolly to go on for the camera to ride back and forth level. All right, I'm going to do this with the dolly. So let's say we have some unlevel ground, just using a couple wedges. Um, first thing you want to do is see what it looks like back and forth like this. It's level. So what we want to do is go side to side. It's, it's going to have to come up about that far on that side. So about approximately that much, two wedges. So what we do, start in the middle, get it raised. Come down to this end. Come back over here. And we place some wedges underneath both ends. Okay, we're level this way. I want to come to the middle of the track and raise the track up to where it's level. And then we move down to the end over here. And we come down to this end. And we see that we have to level just a touch over here. Okay, we're level back and forth. And we are level back and forth. So now, can't have these gaps between the ground and the track because the, the weight of the dolly, the weight of the cameraman, the weight of the camera is going to make the track bend. Some people level like this with their wedges. Some people wed level like this. It really doesn't matter. Um, I like to do it this way so that when people walk by it doesn't come out and they can kick it really easily. and cable can snag on it. I like to do it like this. It's just a personal preference. Okay. 
over here. There you go. Good solid foundation for your Fisher dolly. On to the track. I'm going to disconnect the brake, move the dolly to the end of the track. Now, line it up. The four guys will stick their carry handles in. And lift and put it onto the track. And there you go. Your track is level now. No matter what terrain you're on, you've made it level. But now there's bushes, there's stumps, there's holes that you as a dolly grip have to walk through. The cameraman's got it made. He's going to use one of these things right here, a seat every single time. Camera assistant. Wait, this weighs 300 plus pounds, 200 plus, another 200 plus for the camera operator, another 80 pounds for the camera. You're pushing 700 pounds and you're trying to make it level. That's one of the reasons you want to make it level for a grip standpoint. You want to make it level for the picture, but you definitely want to be level for ease of pushing. Pushing something level on precision wheels, precision track is easy. There are times when you're going to have to go downhill or uphill. Let's say an actor is walking along a dirt road. Well, the dirt road's not going to be level. If you start leveling your track, let's say the road's like this, and your hill is like this. If you start leveling the hill, the track, as the actor walks down the hill, you're going to be like this. You're going to start with them with the picture at their knees, and you're going to end up at the bottom of the picture at the top of their heads. So you're going to have to level to the terrain that the actor is walking on, like this. Um, so you're going to need more than one person, maybe holding the dolly back. More times than not, you're not going downhill. You're going uphill. And you're always going one way or the other to either go back to one or to do the action. So you're going to be sliding up and down. It takes a lot of breath, takes a lot of energy. And like I said, you're going to be stepping in. It's never flat. Even filming here at, F, at F, uh, JL Fisher, it's relatively flat. You still had to put, I still had to put a wedge in. Imagine out in the real world, everything's built to drain someplace, roads have been cut, um, property have not been developed. You're just on unlevel property, unlevel ground all the time. Um, you're going to have to make the decision with the director of photography and the director whether they want the camera to go downhill with the actor or uphill with the actor or are they happy with you being level and them and the actors going out of frame. They never are, but that's that's that. Uh, ten years ago, I was working as a dolly grip on a movie called Lassie, ten or twelve years ago. And we had a 200-foot move that included dialogue between the boy, Timmy, and Lassie. And then they started into a gallop and a run. That means we're running as well. The dolly has to keep up with the actors. Kid running, dog running, three grips pushing, a dolly with a camera assistant, cameraman, and three cables coming off of it. Um, you can't get the cable snagged. You have someone watching the cables. You can't trip. Of the three people running, no one can trip because that's only these two people to do the shot. You can't make any noise because it's a sound take. You have to have flat ground to run on. We had 200 foot track, 200 foot move, not a level piece of ground anywhere. So we made a railroad track with lumber, 200 feet long, made it all level. Then we put the dolly track on top of that and screwed it in. Made us a nice platform. We could not put lumber in between the tracks, so we had to make another run on the side. We spent about $5,000, I would say, on lumber for that 200 foot run and never made the movie. Okay, so I've done in my career maybe 600 music videos, worked with everybody. The last music video I did was uh, about seven months ago, early or late 06, was The Fray, How to Save a Life. Uh, Mark Pellington was the director. Um, very cool dude. We had a lot of very intense moments on that shoot. It was very emotional for everybody. I don't know why. It's not always like that. Sometimes it's just a job. This turned out to be a very emotional job. We had a lot of dolly moves around the piano player, 
around his face, back and forth, off the keys, onto um, his hands, and things like that. So I think, in my mind, you have to be a bit athletic. I've tried every, every one of my crew members on a dolly, one time or another. And they can be big like me, they can be small, but you have to have a certain bit of athleticism with you. Because this is not a, it's not just pushing the dolly. It's not just doing that. It's, if the song is real slow in this instance, you gotta go real slow. You have to come around the actor. You have to come around the piano keys. You have to come off So If you're on the piano keys and you're going through hands and you're on a tight lens, you make, this, you make a move this big, you're gonna flash everything. Nothing's gonna be in focus. You have to move like this. You have to feel the music. You have to feel the dialogue between actors when they're speaking. When you go behind a pole, you have to feel their walk. You have to, you, it's just so many things that you have to consider. You just don't push a dolly. When a person's sitting down, the dolly's at this level. When they bend over to stand up, you have to come up with a camera so that you're not looking up their nose. If they're standing up, and they go to sit down, you have to go down with them. So you're not looking down at them. It's not a very flattering angle looking down at someone's forehead. Not a flattering angle looking up. You want to stay nice and level with them. You have to breathe with the, with the take if you're in dolly grip. Half my guys don't make it first day as dolly grips. They end up doing something else because they, don't, they think it's easy, and it's not. Sometimes you're going in a straight line, and then you have to, to shift gears halfway through so you can come around here, come back to straight, go back to roundy round, which is the only dolly in the world that does this, and you have to get in position. You may have 10, 12 marks on the floor. You have to feel when they're there. If you look at this music video I just mentioned, you can go online and look at it. Um, you can see all the tiny, intricate little moves we did. Now we also did a lot of lock-offs. And again, you have to pay attention. You'll see that we had the camera maybe at that height for 10 minutes for the whole day, for, the whole, for 10 minutes shooting an actor. And then Mark would take someone out and put another person in. And without anybody saying anything, you have to adjust to, from a six foot four person to a three foot five person. And you just have to come down a little until you're at their eye level. You have to think. You have to be there for the cameraman. He can't think for you. He's concentrating on so many other things. Exposure. The director's thinking about the acting. You're part of the machinery. You have to think. No one's going to tell you what to do. You have to think. Because speaking of the athleticism, you, can, you can't be stiff with the dolly. You can't walk, walk, and walk because the frame's going to go bam, bam, bam. You're going to drive your camera operator crazy. He's going to be searching to the right frame, and then he's going to have to come back and keep, he's going to have to keep repositioning himself. What you want to do is you want to be loose and you want to walk on the, ends, on the ends of your heels, on the edge of your feet. You don't want to be flat footed. You don't want to be flat footed doing anything in life. You want to have some grace to yourself and you want to push the dolly nice and slow and quietly and you're just moving along. It's not ballet, but you can think of yourself as moving in a rhythm, in a motion. Okay, like I said before, you have to think. No one's going to tell you What's gonna, you're going to see rehearsals, but you're not, you're not going to be told how to do everything every time. Right now, we're going to start here at this angle. Camera lens is probably about this height. And we're on Frank, who's sitting down. Frank's going to stand up, and we, the director wants to dolly in. Well, he's not going to say, OK, Frank, stand up. If Frank's in the middle of dialogue, he's not going to say, Frank, stand up, Chet, dolly in. It's just going to happen in the scene. So. I'm going to watch for Frank to sit up. No one sits up like this. You'll notice if Frank does something before he sits up. And as a dolly grip, you have to recognize this. You have to pay attention. So go ahead, Frank. I come in like that. You saw him bend down a little and then stand up. You have to read that. Every human being does it, especially actors. They're trained to do that. They're trained to uncross their leg. They're trained to put their hands down at their waist and push up without their knees. There's all kinds of telltale signs. Once you work with an actor for 10 or 15 minutes, you should recognize all these things about them. It's like a game of poker. When, you, when they call the actor over, 
See what that actor does. See how she or he stands up as soon as, as, soon as they are called. Here's how I, most actors will sit there around like this, waiting to be called. They call them, they'll put their hands down like this. Don't start up with a boom right away. Those come up and then you're, you have plenty of time to do it. You don't have to poof, because no one does this. Okay, ready to go. No one does that. Okay, so Frank's looking through a fence and he's looking through a peephole three feet down. Fence is a little lower, he can look over it. So we're down here like this. Frank starts moving over. I push the dolly, I'm walking along with it, and I'm going counterclockwise with this knob to raise the camera up on the boom arm. And try and keep the same distance. Unless you've been told to let him go out of frame. There are some things people are gonna tell you to do, obviously, but if no one tells you what to do, you have to think about it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But if you're right, it ma it's magic sometimes. And going, let's go back to if you're wrong. If you're wrong, the director's gonna tell you you're wrong. But he's also gonna think, well, why is this guy wrong? It's because I didn't tell him what to do. So if you have a director who's totally concentrating on the actors, and not really concentrating on the dolly grip, he just thinks it's gonna happen magically, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But you just have to, if you're directing, you have to be patient with your dolly grip. If you're a dolly grip, you have to be patient with your director. Simple as that. I have to push the dolly. It has to go that way. It has to go smoothly. I have to be quiet and I'm turning this knob to go from A mark to B mark. And I have to hit the floor mark. I have to hit the arm mark that I put here and it all has to be done smoothly. There's, a, there's usually a mark on the floor. There's an A mark and a B mark. Let's say we're starting here. The dolly has to travel to there. So that, you've established that. Now, in that, the actor stands up. So you have to start here at this height, and you have to end at that height. Now, you have to end smooth. You can't bring the camera up like this. No cameraman's going to like you. So let's start. Start pushing, and as you're pushing, you're bringing your arm up. And as you get to B, you want to finish both moves at the same time. You don't want to be end your boom and still move. It looks like crap. You don't want to end your move and then continue your boom because that looks like crap. You want it all to move at the same time, like this. Want to be nice and smooth. And in your mind, you're just about to end your dolly. Everything ends at the same time. And the cameraman appreciates that. Everything's fluid with him. He doesn't have to adjust. He hasn't stopped going in and then going up. You don't want moves to look like this. You want them to go up and down. Nothing, there's nothing that should be linear, like 90 degree moves in our business. Everything's fluid. Put a piece of tape in between here. It's a wheel that rotates like this. And you just put tape on. And then I've made a Sharpie mark across these two white lines. That's my first mark, low. And then I've made another mark where I want to stop. Right there. So we go back down to one. And this way I can hit one and two every time. It's not a guess. Now I'm going to go from I've marked my wheels, center of the wheel, from here, and it's about a four foot, four and a half foot mark. Move that way. So, here we go. Sometimes they want, the director wants you to make a move this slow. Maybe even slower. This is a dolly grip's dream come true. Right here. Everything's perfect. You can look. You can take your eye back that way. You can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's other, most of the time though, the nice slow move, that's great. You can see that mark, you can see this mark. Your eyes can go back and forth, no problem. It's in the field of vision. Most of the time, they want you to go right about this speed here. Now I'm a little short, not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. It'd be great if I hit the mark every time. I'm not going to, but this mark is right because that's where that eye level is. It's not a tilt up, it's not a tilt down. 
This is an inch short. This is right on. If I tried it, if I practiced it, if I did the move 10, 15 times, which most takes are, you'd get it. In the last five or six takes, I'm going to get it. And that was my first attempt at that one. He's going to want it right here. So we put our, we put our level on. We see we're going to have to fill it on that side. So we get our clip or get our uh, wedges. Okay, this happens to be level that way. So we'll come to the end here. That's level. That's level. We go along and fill it like we did inside. Very nice and easy. Just fill it, don't raise it. And you're ready for your dolly move again. Now, let's say we want to dolly this way. We've established that the dolly track goes here. Center up a touch, and this happens to be level there. Here has to come up just a touch on this side. So grab our wedges. Come to the end. Fill that. Fill that. Let's go to the other end. There. And then we're level again. Again, I'm just filling in. Filling in the little gaps. And ready for a dolly. That way. That was across a little bit of a dip. Again, no, nothing we've done here is really difficult. However, you're always going to get this situation where the director wants to go from there to there. Now, you can see it's not level. So we get some apple boxes. Put them down at this end. Now you can guesstimate which, one, which way you're going with this. This looks like about a half apple. So we get our level. We'll go up a half uh, apple. Now we'll go with pancake. Okay, that's level. What's next? Fill it in. We don't have enough apple boxes to do that today. We don't have enough wedges. But once you get your level, fill it in. Make it sturdy. Make it strong. Make it support 800 pounds. And there you go. You've got it made. 
when you saw me setting this up, you saw me set it in on these rungs. Um, they can be bent. They can get bent over the course of a show, a movie, you're on for nine months, you're out of town for nine months, you're not going to call Fisher every three weeks and say, I need this, 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 and this. You just make do. Some of these get bent. I put it here because it could stand up on its own. If I put it here, it'll fall off. And I'm doing this by myself. A lot of dolly grips have to do everything by themselves. Um, this is just going to get a little bit of a level so it stands up. Get everything in place. And then I put it here. And the funny thing is, this is not level. And this is. So you, gotta, you have to go off of what your wheels are riding on, not what's supporting what you're riding on. So there's that. Uh, today we're here going to show you about the Fisher Boom. Um, my credentials are uh, basically uh, sitcoms and specials like uh, Will and Grace, Family Ties, and uh, Primal Fear and stuff like that. I've been a sound boom operator for 15 years, uh, been in the Union 695 IA for 25. Uh, today we're going to show you the characteristic, characteristics of a boom and uh, how to use it. Okay, sound boom is used for uh, collecting dialogue on sets, uh, sitcoms, soap operas, specials, whatnot. Uh, we need uh, to use a boom, a microphone boom, and place it where you need to versus a hand boom. Um, you can use the articulation and the racking of a sound boom, a Fisher sound boom, to get the microphone where you need it. Today we're going to talk to you about the boom bass, better known as a primulator. Then we're going to move back to the back of the boom show you how to move the microphone and tilt the microphone with appropriate angles and whatnot. Then we'll work to the handle and then we'll show you the microphone hanger itself. Okay, I'm going to jump down and rotate the base so we can start talking about the base. This handle here releases the brake. This handle turns it into steer or crab. As you can see, we're rotating the base. Okay, this is better known as the brake lever. Push down for the brake forward and backwards pull it up, releases the brake. The handle on the left side takes it from steer to crab. This is your steer mode, which means the back wheel turns only. Then you go into crab mode, which makes all three wheels steer. Okay, next on the boom base, we have a feature called cable guards. You have one front and rear of the tires. They come down, and when you're moving the boom, they safely move the cables out of the way so you don't run over your cables. Next, we have a cable guard on the right wheel, and we don't on the left. Notice if you push the boom forward with the cable guard, it pushes the cable out of the way, and the one that doesn't, you run over the cable. On the boom base itself, we have a raise and lowering handle. If you need to raise the base to get up over d different objects, you just pull forward, which raises the base, pull backwards to lower the base. Now, when you run out of air, you need more air, we have a manual pump. This yellow handle here pumps into a accumulator pump which pushes the hydraulics up for the base. Now if you have electricity on stages, we have electric pump. Just like the 10 and 11 dollies, it has an automatic shutoff so you don't have to worry about over pumping. Now we're going to start back at the boom arm itself. This handle right here rotates the mic and this other handle here, which looks like a brake handle, you squeeze it and it changes the articulation or the angle of the mic. This is the rotation of your mic, pushing it forward and backwards like this. Squeezing this brake handle changes the angle of the mic. The two axes we just spoke about were the rotation of the mic and the articulation of the mic. The rotation of the mic with this handle also has a brake. So if you prefer to lock it off in a position you need to, this brake right here will break off the rotation of the mic, locking in a position that you need. The articulation axis, which angles the mic, is the brake handle back here. You can also lock that off in the position you need to with this handle right here, rotating it to the lock position. Okay, the next axis is the extraction and the reaction of the boom, or we call a racking in and out. This handle operates this drum, which turns 
racking the mic out, the boom arm itself, or racking it in. The two other brakes equipped on the Fisher boom are the tilt brake. This brake locks the arm in an up and down position. This brake locks it from rotating from left to right. Next, we're going to rotate the base so you get a better view on the accessories that come with the boom. First of all, we have a script holder for you can put your script or whatnot here. That adjusts back and forth the angle you need. Okay, I'm going to walk around and rotate the arms so you can see what we call the monitor hanger and brackets. We usually use a 9-inch color monitor on uh, sitcoms and multi-cameras for quad split. This bracket here allows you to adjust it to where you see fit. Okay, now we're going to swing the boom around and show you a real-life situation on how to use the boom. Okay, here we have a live situation, two people speaking to each other. The nice thing about a boom with the articulation is if one of the people walk away, you don't have to move the arm, you can just articulate the mic. And you can also rack out to follow him. And as he's walking back, you place the microphone in front of the person's mouth. And with the rotation, you can rotate 360 degrees. The microphone we're using today is the Sennheiser 416. It's a very, very shotgun looking mic. It has a very tight pattern. In other words, you have to work the actors a lot more than you would an omnidirectional. And with a sound boom, Fisher sound boom, you can get the pattern of the mic right over the person's mouth. Okay, with the articulation of the mic, you can shotgun it out like this, and then you rack in, still putting the microphone in the pattern so you pick up the dialogue. Now when they've planted, you're back to your normal operating procedure. Say if you have a boom shadow on a person's head here, you can play back further and gun the mic up, as we say, and still be in the pattern of the microphone. Or if you need to play it flatter to beat a boom shadow, you can play straight down. With the particular microphone we're using today, the Sennheiser 416, a good starting height is about 18 to 24 inches. Once again, this is a shotgun mic. It has a very, very tight pattern. This is a good starting distance to use right here, anywhere between 18 inches and two feet. Now with this pattern, the higher you go with the microphone, the wider the pattern gets. Also, you'll get more noise the further you get away from their mic. So about two feet to 18 inches, it's a good starting point. Well, one thing I've learned, which is a tip, uh, when I first started out, um, depth perception actually is a big, big key in boom operating. Uh, make sure your eyes are correct, get them checked annually, and uh, do tips or actually do exercises to keep your depth perception uh, in check because that's a big deal in boom operating. Another little tip I've learned over the years is set etiquette. First thing I do is I find out where the craft service is. No, I was just kidding. Just stay light, have fun with it, but go, you know, make yourself known. Go meet the lighting director. Make, your, make a friend your lighting director. He will make or break your career. Um, if you're in good with the lighting director, he will help you. And work as a team. We're all there to work as a team.